follow a common system of celestial allegory, a system which actually unites them all, from the myths of ancient Egypt to the stories in the Bible, to the Vedas of ancient India, and the sacred stories and texts of the cultures of North America, South America, and Central America, across the oceans of the Pacific, in Australia, Asia, Africa, what is now called the Middle East, Northern Europe, and virtually every culture on our planet. It is a system designed to impart profound ancient wisdom which was once entrusted to humanity as our common inheritance. In order to see how this common system works and to begin to grasp the message it was designed to convey, let's briefly consider one of the most important of the heavenly cycles which is used as a foundation for these sacred myths of humanity, the annual cycle of the zodiac. And then briefly look at some familiar sacred stories which incorporate this cycle. Although this may seem very basic, let's first consider the daily east to west motion of the heavenly objects. Then we'll look at the night by night motion which is also east to west. And then we'll be able to see why the zodiac wheel follows what we could call the opposite motion. Uh, west to east motion. You're probably already aware that the stars appear to travel through the night sky from east to west every night, which is of course a function of the fact that our earth is rotating towards the east, which makes objects in the sky appear to move towards the west, just as the forward motion of a car or a train can make objects outside appear to be moving backwards. Here we're looking towards the south from an observation point in the northern hemisphere at latitude 35 north, and because we're looking south, east is to our left and west is to our right. The Earth's rotation will make the stars rise out of the eastern horizon, cross the sky from east to west, and then sink down into the western horizon, just as the sun does during the day. If you just stare right there at the eastern horizon point, you can get yourself to realize that it's not the stars that are moving, but the earth itself which is turning. And then as the eastern horizon plunges forward due to the spinning of our planet, it makes the stars rise and stream towards the west. Just stare right there at the eastern horizon and you'll start to realize that that's what's going on. So that explains why the nightly motion of the stars is east to west, just like the sun. But there's another important east to west motion that takes place, and that is due to the Earth's progress around the sun. It's different. As we move forward on our annual orbit on this planet that's, that's speeding through its orbit, that motion actually causes the stars to rise a few minutes earlier each night because as our planet makes quote forward progress on its orbit its turning reveals that same bit of space a few minutes earlier than it did the night before meaning that stars will rise a few minutes earlier than they did the previous night in order to observe this motion, let's focus in on the stars in the zodiac band. That band of stars located astride the what's called the ecliptic path. It's the path that the sun, as well as generally the moon and the visible planets, all we follow through the sky as we on Earth observe them from our observation points on this spinning ball of the Earth. Zodiac constellations visible on this screen include Virgo, Leo, Cancer the Crab, Gemini, and Taurus. On successive nights, the stars along the zodiac band will rise about four minutes earlier each night for observers at this latitude, which means the constellations will be a little farther along each night for an observer located at the same place and observing at the same time of night. You can observe that in these frames where you can see the date displayed at the bottom of the screen. On successive nights, the stars have already moved a bit further than they were the previous night. And this is a function of the Earth having, quote, moved forward in its 
annual orbital path. This motion is also east to west. See, the constellations have moved each night a few degrees further west because they've, they rose a few minutes earlier, so they've gotten a few degrees further along on the sky on their way to the west. So as we cycle through the year, these stars will eventually cycle out of the picture to the west, uh, reaching the western horizon before nightfall, you know, during the day, so you won't be able to see them at night. But as we go through the year, those stars that cycle out will be replaced by new ones, which um, keep rising a little bit earlier, so they get a little further along, so we're able to see them. Now, the important thing to note is that while the nightly motion of the constellations is east to west, and this night-by-night -night progress of the constellations that we've just been discussing is also east to west, the sun moves through the zodiac in the opposite direction from both of these two motions. What, what does that mean? What we're talking about when I say the sun moving through, we're talking about the background stars that are present, specifically the background stars that are present in the east just before the sun rises each morning. Focus here on the eastern horizon where the sun's going to rise. If the night by night motion makes the constellations move a little further along, that is further west each night, then that means that the background scene there each morning where the sun rises will be a little different. The constellations will be shifting westward, so that scene will be a little different, which means that the sun itself will be going through the constellations in the opposite direction. It will rise against the background of stars that will always be a little more to the east each morning. At the rate that the zodiac background moves night by night towards the west, that means that the sun will rise in a new zodiac constellation, one further east, about every month. In other words, because of the night-by-night -night progress that these visible zodiac constellations have made, the sun would rise first in Taurus, then as Taurus keeps getting further along each night, I'm talking about the stars on this picture, it, it would have risen first in Taurus, then Taurus keeps moving further west, so then it would start rising in Gemini, out of the stars on this page. Then as that night-by-night -night motion continued, it, it then started rising against the background of stars in the constellation Cancer, and then as that kept going, then against the background of Leo the Lion, and finally rising against the background in Virgo, out of the stars that we're looking at here. So. When we say rising in, it's rising in a progression of stars that goes in the opposite direction that the stars travel on their nightly and even on their night-by-night -night motions. And this brings us finally to the zodiac wheel. This wheel is a way of depicting that progress of the changing, quote, background stars for the sun's rising throughout the year. Here is Virgo which was furthest east on our previous screen. And then ahead of Virgo was Leo, and then Cancer, and then Gemini, and then Taurus. So the sun's progress through them, as we saw, would go this way. So uh, after Virgo keeps rising earlier, the sun's background stars would be Libra, and Scorpio, then Sagittarius, then Capricorn, then Aquarius, then Pisces, and then Aries, and that brings us back to Taurus. The sun will actually rise in each of these in the order depicted here, moving around the circle of the year in a clockwise direction as the signs are arranged in this diagram. So now that we understand this motion, we can understand that these month-long risings in different backgrounds correspond to different seasons. We're all familiar with what the seasons look like in different months, know what it's like in January versus July, or March versus September, what it feels like. We have a good idea of that. Well, the way this wheel is arranged here, you can become familiar with which signs of the zodiac correspond to those same parts of the year as well. Here the top of the wheel corresponds to the point of summer solstice, where the days are the longest. So this discussion is going to be from a northern half.
hemisphere perspective, an observer in the northern hemisphere. That summer solstice for the northern hemisphere takes place around June 21st on the calendar each year. It's between the signs of Gemini and Cancer on our wheel as arranged here. This wheel is for the age of Aries. I'm not going to get into the processional ages in this video. That's another cycle. Um, I'm not going to get into why we use the age of Aries for understanding the system behind the majority of the world's myths. I've done that in other videos and in my books and in many posts on my blog. But just know that the summer solstice is the top of the year where the days are the longest. Then as we progress past that day of solstice, days start growing shorter, but they're still longer than nights as we continue through the summer, through July and August. But there's a point where the nights cross over and start becoming longer than the days. A point marked by the autumnal or the fall equinox that's in September for the Northern Hemisphere. It's at the juncture between the signs of Virgo, the Virgin, and Libra, the scales or the balance. And the balance is on the right hand side of this wheel at the three o'clock position if we're using clock face terminology. Once we cross that point, we head into the lower half of the year when the nights are longer than days. And as we keep going down, days are still getting shorter and shorter until we get that lowest point, shortest day of the year, the point of the winter solstice at the bottom of the wheel. That would be six o'clock on a clock face. And after that, the days start getting longer again, but they're still going to be shorter than the nights until we start to approach that day of the spring equinox. That's where the days finally getting longer and longer. They finally get longer than nights. And then we enter the upper half of the year back towards that uppermost point again. So with this, all this in mind, we can now see how the sacred stories use this cycle. To illustrate this, let's go to a very familiar story. And then we can use that to explore what all of this might mean. I've talked in a previous video about some of the evidence that demonstrates that in the New Testament Easter story, the Holy Week starts off with the entry into Jerusalem, which is a city on a high hill, the highest point, in fact, on the upper half of the year, the top of the zodiac wheel. That's what this Easter story talks about, actually, the whole zodiac wheel and the triumphal entry is the starting point where we're entering in at the very top of the wheel. And at the very top of that high city on the hill, the tr after the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, we get to the upper room, which is that point at which the sun is uh, all the way at the very pinnacle of the year, the top of our wheel. And that's where the sun is gonna turn and start going down again. And sure enough, this is where things start to head downward in the story towards the crucifixion. And the crucifixion is going to have um, symbolism from the autumnal equinox. A previous video that I've done, which I'll link right here, explains why the triumphal entry involves the Christ telling his disciples to go fetch him an ass and her colt it's because there are two stars in the solstice sign of Cancer the Crab that are labeled, they're called, their names are the Northern and the Southern Donkey Colts, Acellus Borealis, Acellus Australis. They are found uh, in the story, in the Gospel according to Mark, the, the Donkey Colt is found where two ways meet. Then when Judas Iscariot, who as I explained in that other video, also is connected with the sign of Cancer the Crab. When Judas Iscariot goes out, we're on our way down towards that fall equinox. We're heading down in earnest. When, when the crab goes out, that's when we're starting to slope downwards towards the equinox, that point where night will take over and become dominant over the day. Then the accounts of the agony in the garden and the crucifixion are also full of zodiac imagery. I'm not going to go into all of that here, but you may be able to see how these two quotations, one describing the agony, one describing the crucifixion, are references to the signs of Virgo, 
the Virgin, and of Libra, the scales. Those are the two signs on either side of the equinox, the fall equinox. The book of Hebrews, the scriptures in the book of Hebrews tell us that the Christ had to suffer on the cross, quote, without the gate, that is, outside of the gate, without outside of the gate. The gate being, I believe, the equinox crossing point. In that sign of Libra, the balances, that is the sign just without the gate, just outside of the gate, on the autumnal side of the wheel. The Easter cycle, after dealing with that triumph of darkness over light at the fall equinox, also, of course, the story then moves to the eventual triumph of light over dark on the other side of the wheel at the spring equinox, where the sun finally overcomes the lower half of the year, through which it has had to toil since the fall equinox. Here at the spring equinox, we see lots of very important zodiac imagery again. Just to highlight a couple of those, the spring equinox takes place between the sign of Pisces and the sign of Aries. The sign of Aries being the first sign to lead up into the upper half of the year as after we've crossed that lower uh, half of the year. As they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid thereon. As they were finally getting across that lower half of the year, the fire symbol is a is a symbology of the equinox, of the ecliptic, the burning line of the sun crossing, and then the reinstatement of Peter, the famous triple admonition, feed my lambs, feed my sheep, feed my sheep, found in John chapter 21, verses 15 through 17. Now the big question is why? What does all this celestial symbology mean? Some people argue that these scriptures are simply celebrating the annual cycle, the return of spring, the cycle of life. But I believe there is abundant evidence that these ancient sacred stories from around the world, all of them built upon this same system of metaphor, were intended to preserve and transmit a message that goes beyond the cycles of the natural world, as beautiful as those cycles can be, but rather knowledge with profound spiritual significance, which operates on multiple interconnected levels, the outline of which we can just begin to touch on here. On a very broad level, the motion of the stars through the sky and their plunging down into the earth at one horizon to travel, figuratively speaking, through the earth and then rise again into the sky out of the opposite horizon, was used to symbolize an understanding of the interconnection between the visible, physical, material world and the invisible world of spirit, with the realm of spirit represented by the heavens above and the material realm represented by this lower plane of earth and water into which the stars and the other heavenly bodies descend and disappear. And while we can see this operating even in the daily cycles of the sun and the stars, we can see it even more on some of the longer cycles, including the cycle of the year that we've been talking about, the zodiac wheel gave the ancients a very sophisticated tool with which to explore and illustrate the experience of the human soul and this interconnection between the dual realms of spirit, the invisible realm, and matter, the material, the visible realm. These two realms are interconnected, which is a fact that we don't easily perceive, caught up as we are in all the necessities of existing and getting along in the material world. This material world, it, it, uh, it definitely captures our attentions and our affections, and it works to make us forget that we are actually spiritual beings as well as physical beings, and 
we actually originate in a spiritual realm and then incarnate temporarily in this material realm for the purposes not of falling in love with the material realm, but for the purpose of some kind of spiritual growth and evolution which cannot take place any other way. One of the messages that these ancient texts are picturing for us is the message that we are beings who are a cross between material and spiritual, between the visible and invisible, and that the universe we inhabit is also composed of both a visible physical material aspect plus an invisible spirit dimension which connects to every single rock, tree, animal, person, in fact to every single molecule and subatomic particle, the spiritual the spiritual realm connects and interpenetrates and, and infuses every single atom of this material realm and it's actually the invisible realm which is the source and the origin of the visible realm. This great cycle of the year has a great cross in it which we've been seeing as we discuss this. The great cross of the year that's created by the horizontal line between the equinoxes and that vertical line that runs from the winter solstice up to the summer solstice. And all these ancient sacred traditions around the world use this as a picture of the truth about our human existence and about our dual spiritual material universe that we inhabit. The horizontal line represents the physical, the material, the visible realm into which we're cast down when we incarnate from our original home in the spirit world. And then the vertical line represents the invisible realm. And one of our purposes in this physical realm is to remember the spirit aspect that's in us and in everything and then connect to it and call it forth and elevate it and make it manifest. And this, in a very real sense, is the meaning of the word blessing, bringing that positive higher energy of the invisible or the divine, bringing it forth here in the physical creation. And the opposite action is cursing, which acts to diminish or denigrate the spiritual component in anything, reducing everything to gross matter. If you think of most swear words or uh, cursing expressions. They all have to do with that concept and so does racism and sexism. It's reducing everything to the physical, exterior, visible component. So does violence. Violence does, it acts in the same direction. It acts to uh, denigrate and, and force into the physical and, and ignore the spiritual or beat down the spiritual. So in this dual realm that we inhabit in this combined spiritual physical state, we're always in danger of believing that this material realm is the main focus and the thing to pursue and to fall in love with and try and manipulate and and use and fall into those traps and uh, uh, achieve our material success through but all the ancient sacred stories point us towards our connection to the spirit realm and urge us to elevate that and call it forth and amplify it and unleash the spiritual component in ourselves and in all the universe around us unfortunately misreading these ancient scriptures as being literal stories can cause us to miss that message and can even turn it on its head and it can cause us to externalize the stories and see them as being about someone else about one special person or one special family of humanity and divide people up these scriptures are about each and every human being um, in a very real sense, literalizing these stories or taking them literally brings them down, so to speak, into the physical plane, when actually they're supposed to be pointing us to the spiritual plane, the spiritual realm that's within ourselves and within everyone else and actually within and behind everything in the universe. We're all connected to it. It actually connects us both to nature and the universe and to everybody else on the spiritual plane. Once we understand the way that the solstice and equinox cycle allegory and the related zodiac wheel 
allegory operate, it becomes much easier to start to see this complex but beautiful system operating at the foundation of so many of the myths and sacred traditions around the world, often taking on very different outward forms, but always with the same recognizable common patterns underneath. And as we start to recognize this pattern in the different stories and scriptures, it becomes more and more clear that they were not intended to be understood as literal historical records and that the different myths of the different cultures of humanity, including those in the Old and New Testament of the Bible, are not describing the actions of literal and historical human actors, but instead that they are star myths, celestial allegories which point to the heavenly cycles and which convey profound truths about the combination spiritual material universe in which we live and about the reason why we're here in this spiritual material incarnate condition in which we find ourselves in this life. And then, as we apply this knowledge, we can realize our purpose of blessing and not cursing. Because ultimately, the ancients who gave us these sacred star myths were telling us that this zodiac wheel actually describes the path followed by our own soul, the path that each and every one of us is walking. I hope that this information is a blessing to you. I believe that the deliberate suppression and perversion of this knowledge has been a source of tremendous violence, racism, oppression, and even genocide in the past, and that the suppression of this knowledge continues to be a curse, leading to division and violence among mankind and also to the destruction and desecration of our planet and its sacred places and the other beings who share it with us, the other creatures who share it with us. I believe that greater understanding of this ancient wisdom that was entrusted to humanity as a precious inheritance may be one of the most important first steps we can take towards reversing that curse.